Hey everybody, today we're debating whether or not there is scientific evidence for whether or not Muhammad was the one true prophet, and we are starting right now. With Nadir's opening statement, thanks so much for being with us. Nadir, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to begin with just kind of making a quick comment about our last debate I had with, uh, with David Wood. Uh, there was a little video going around, kind of got viral about me, you know, kind of changing the topic because I got stumped or something like that. Um, I forget what it was, but the video is a hoax. We have David right here. He can vouch for that. No such thing took place. And of course, you can go to my YouTube page to find out more about the video hoax. Okay, so let's begin uh, this discussion. So why is it that Prophet Muhammad, how does science prove uh, Muhammad is a true prophet? Well, it's very easy. What you are seeing in front of you is misery and suffering. This is the misery and suffering caused by the scientific errors of the Bible. Well, how does that make Muhammad a true prophet? Well, the miracle you are about to witness today is Muhammad actually corrects these scientific errors and it removes the biblical curse and sets the victims free. Don't believe me? Let's have a look real quick at the first one. Both Muhammad and Jesus, and you can say the Bible and in and, and Islam, we talk about uh, meat consumption. The Bible removes all restrictions on meat consumption. Now, I'm going to go very quickly through this. You could please hit pause on the YouTube just to get my uh, references uh, because I'm going to go through, I'm going to fly through this. Okay, so the Bible removes all restrictions on meat consumption. Why is that a bad thing? Because there are certain animals you do not want to eat, and those are bats and monkeys. Quoting the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, bats are basically the pathogen for the COVID virus. And so basically, this is known as zoonotic disease, which hops from man onto uh, from animals to man. Monkeys are the pathogen for Ebola and and uh, and AIDS. So, so these are so this is a catastrophic scientific error. So let's look at the impact. Well, going to this next reference, monkeys have the consumption have the have the potential to wipe out all of humanity due to these zoonotic diseases. So let's look at the impact. The impact here, as we can see. All over the world, Christians now eat monkey. Why? Jesus removed all restrictions on that. And there's many references which I can share with you. Here's the one. Some Liberian Christians eat monkey for spiritual reasons. Now, how does this prove Muhammad is a true prophet? This is not the topic that <laughs> scientific errors in the Bible. Lo and behold, Muhammad also talks about the same topic and corrects the false narration in the Bible. And, it, and Islam condemns the eating of monkey meat, as we can see from the following reference. Allah's messenger forbade the eating of meat of beasts having fangs. So this is an astonishing scientific miracle. The Prophet Muhammad is giving you the preventive cure for COVID, the preventive cure for AIDS and Ebola in this one following hadith. Now let's look at the impact. Uh, the impact of the American Red Cross recognizes Islam for its contribution to science and highlights James. James is a, a Muslim, as it says over here, who is not allowed to eat monkey. And that is, again, is a pathogen for these viruses. So the question which I have for David Wood is very simple. How do you explain an alleged false prophet giving humanity the preventive cure for Ebola, AIDS, and COVID-19 while while the true Lord and Savior is giving you the prescriptions for these pandemics. So let's see how David would answer that question. So, okay, both Jesus and Muhammad also talked about washing hands. Let's see who does the better job uh, of answering that. The CDC, going back to the CDC, they, they state very clearly, you got to wash your hands before you eat. Why? Because there's many diseases you can get, like child bedside fever, which has killed many people. Uh, there's also parasitic diseases, like, uh, like, like parasites such as tapeworms and things like that. Ah, so now we go to the Bible. And again, please hit pause on your YouTube to get all my references um, uh, so you can kind of read along. Uh, the disciples came to Jesus or I'm sorry, the disciples, they were not washing their hands before they ate. So people are like, what's up? Why are you not washing your hands? This said Jesus in a fit of rage. And he answers them, uh, he answered them with unwashed hands that does not defile them. So 
if Jesus was really God, if he was really the Lord, <laughs> why would he get mad at life-saving science of washing your hands before you eat? You know, that doesn't make sense. So the Christians will say, oh, well, you see, Jesus was just condemning the ritual, the ritual of, the, of it. Okay, let's go along with that. But how is it that you, <laughs> such life-saving science you see as a meaningless ritual? So this, even if we were to grant this, that shows poor judgment on the part of the Lord and Savior. How does this prove Muhammad is a true prophet? Let's go to see how Muhammad now answers the question. Muhammad it's, it states over here in the following hadith that and he wanted if he wanted to eat he would wash his hands. So here we see Prophet Muhammad is reinstating as a ritual the very same thing which made Jesus Christ enraged as a ritual washing your hands and islam has won once again the recognition of the scientific community as we can see over here actually where's my article on this <laughs> well, i'll get you that article in just a second here but science also tells us yeah washing hands is good but clipping your nails is also important too wash your hands and clipping your nails according to the national library of medicine as you can see over here does muhammad say the same thing you got it Prophet Muhammad in the following hadith orders people to wash their uh, hands and clip their nails. So once again, the Prophet وسلم, Muhammad wins the recognition of the scientific community. As we can see, WHO in the peer-reviewed article, they praise Prophet Muhammad. They say Prophet Muhammad has always urged Muslims to wash frequently and especially after some clearly defined tasks. So here we see that the scientific community is recognizing Islam for its contribution to science. So the argument which David has to refute now, how do you explain? an alleged false prophet giving scientifically superior answers than the Lord and Savior himself. And if you are a true believer, David, if you are a true believer in the Jesus Christ, then I will challenge you, don't let science sway you. Do not read science into the Bible and say, no, no, Jesus really meant to go wash your hands. Considering the fact how it angered your Lord and Savior to wash your hands before they eat. I will challenge you to publicly rebuke Muhammad and all his followers because we all wash our hands before we eat as a ritual, the very same thing which Jesus <laughs> condemned. So here we see yet a second scientific error corrected by Prophet Muhammad Let us go on and see how many more. Bo both Jesus and Muhammad talked about alcohol. Let's see who does a better job. Well, we see from the from the following peer reviewed study. Uh, well, basically, the Quran condemns alcohol. And let us see from the following peer reviewed uh, study over here. This is coming from the European Child of Adolescent Psychology. It says Muslim women, as a result of the teachings of Islam, are 50 times lower than the global average to give birth to a fetal alcohol child. So here we see that Islam is giving a scientifically superior answer on the question of alcohol. And so, you know, many Christians, they try to debate, say, oh, what about alcohol in the Quran? You see, uh, alcohol is allowed in heaven. And they'll say, oh, you know, Muhammad himself, he drank alcohol, which is ridiculous. But they'll make these arguments. And they'll say, well, in the, that's the Quran, they'll say the alcohol is actually good. I don't know if David's going to offer these explanations, but here's my response. Look, whatever you see as a problem in the Quran about alcohol, multiplied by 10, say it's 10 times worse than what you're saying. That doesn't change the fact. In no way does it, uh, you know, refute the fact that the Quran still gives a scientifically superior answer uh, on the question of alcohol than Jesus, telling us, "Well, but what about all these other problems? Science is not <laughs> science is not concerned with that. Even with all we were to address all, accept all the alleged problems, which can be easily refuted, it doesn't change the fact. Once again, Muhammad gives a scientifically superior answer than Jesus. So that's what makes Muhammad a true prophet. Let us go to the next example. The Bible stigmatizes epileptics as demon-possessed. This is what we read in ancient pagan lit uh, literature. We see that there was this uh, belief that epileptics suffer from demonic possession. We find, and, and we find once again in the Bible that there was an ep a kid suffering from, from uh, seizures. They, came, they brought him to Jesus and they said, look, this guy has, uh, has a problem. He had this, all the symptoms of epilepsy. What? He grit his teeth. He, uh, 
he grit his teeth, he foamed at the mouth, and he had this since he was young. Those are clearly <laughs> the symptoms of an epileptic. Jesus repeats the, the, the ancient pagan myth and accuses a boy of being demon possessed and allegedly cures him. In order to save Christianity, the Christians say, listen, this is just all a coincidence. You see, epileptics and demon possessed people, they share the same symptoms. So thus they become indistinguishable, right? Yeah. And what about that pagan mythology? That's just another coincidence. Okay, let's buy it. Let's go along with it. It creates another set of a different type of problems. What problems does that create? Now they're indistinguishable. How do you know who's really demon possessed and who's an epileptic? You see, you can look at the epileptics and you say, you are demon possessed. And that's exactly what happens. This Jesus miracle debacle unleashes a brutal wave of persecution against epileptics. Look at the impact over here because they all share the same symptoms, right? Of course, you got to be kind of gullible to accept that, but oh well. Here we see from historical references that all throughout history, epileptics have been uh, subjected to these exorcisms and other types of cruel type of spiritual remedies. And we can see, and I'm going to quote to you how this curse even follows the epileptics today. Here we find, here we, I'm quoting the Epilepsy Foundation, in which, they, in, which a, in which a spotlights a young boy who's suffering from epilepsy. Look what he says over here. Has anyone had a problem with a religious family member whipping out Mark 9 and basically saying, you're a demon possessed, you're not right with God? What caused this? The teachings of the New Testament. You can interpret it however you want, but the impact cannot change. Let us go to the peer-reviewed journal of Dr. Carl Oten Naken. He, he's a specialist in neurology from Oslo University. In the following peer-reviewed article, he, point, he, he, he points the finger at the teachings of the New Testament as responsible, a contributing factor for stigmatizing epileptics as being demon-possessed. Listen to what he says in this article. Christianization reinforced the belief in the healing by rituals. The New Testament describes how Jesus healed a boy, and he goes on quoting that. So notice when I say, look, there are curses in the Bible. This is backed by science. I'm quoting you history. I'm quoting you science. Uh, so how does this prove Muhammad is a true prophet? An epileptic also came to prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa And guess what he doesn't say? You got it. He doesn't accuse the boy of being demon possessed. Muhammad refuses to perform any kind of exorcisms or anything like that. And he says, I will invoke Allah to cure the boy. So the fact that Muhammad's name is not inside the scientific literature, that's the miracle <laughs> which I'm presenting to you. All the scientific literature on this subject, you will see point the finger at Christ. He is the one who is responsible for stigmatizing the uh, epileptics as being demon possessed. And that is a miracle, the scientific miracle, which proves Muhammad is a true prophet. He is the one who will lift the biblical curses upon mankind, which was which the scientific errors caused by, by the Bible. So let's wrap this up here. Unlike the Bible, which is full of scientific contradictions, as we have all seen, I will challenge David Wood to show me one scientific contradiction in the Quran. I will extend the great URL challenge. I presented to you references from science, which, which actually praise Islam. Show me one reference from science, a URL, a link, uh, which, which, which contradicts the Quran. You will never be able to do so. So this was a challenge which I presented to his buddy, apostate prophet, uh, in my debate, which you can watch over here. And you will watch apostate prophet fall on his face and fail that challenge. And as a result, AP ran away and canceled all future debates from that humiliation. I predict the same thing is going to happen here because the Quran is in complete harmony with modern science. And that's what's going to be demonstrated here. But look, the issue of contradictions in science, I'll tell you something. The Bible contradicts science, but I still believe it is from God. There's verses which are divinely inspired in there. Here's my point. Telling us that the Bible or the Quran contradicts science that does not make all the evidence I've presented to you disappear or invalidate it. The Christians offer many what are called reconciliations, which are, oh, you know, maybe the Bible got changed. See, Jesus was a human, and as a human, he made mistakes, stuff like that. Okay, those things work. Why am I offering this disclaimer? Because I know I'll never get the opportunity to address all of the objections against Islam. And when, in fact, these things do not uh, 
uh, how shall I say, disprove the prophet of Muhammad, all it does, it just brings into the question its reliability. Has this book been changed or something like that? So let's pound the gavel. Telling us, oh, the Quran contradicts science or the Hadith contradicts science. Just smile at David and just nod your head. That ain't gonna, that ain't gonna help him tonight. You gotta, you gotta beat the scientific evidence which I have presented to you, which make Prophet Muhammad a true prophet. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that opening, Nadir. And we're going to kick it over to David Wood for his opening as well. Want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we're a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up, including Islam versus atheism, which has more evidence, which is shown at the bottom right of your screen. That's next Friday with Apostate Prophet and Perfect Dawah. You don't want to miss it. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. And with that, thanks so much, David. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James. And thank you, Nadir, for challenging me to this debate on whether science proves that the most obvious false prophet in history is a true prophet. When it comes to science, Muhammad was wrong on virtually everything he could possibly get wrong. Whenever Muhammad made a clear scientific statement, it was clearly wrong, and Muslim apologists are therefore forced to misrepresent and distort unclear verses in a desperate attempt to provide evidence for their faith. I don't want anyone to miss the big picture of just how wrong Muhammad was, so here in my opening statement, I'll give you an overview of Muhammad's thoughts about the universe, about human reproduction, and about disease and personal hygiene. What was Muhammad's view of the structure of the universe? I'll begin towards the bottom of the universe. Surah 68 verse 1 of the Quran reads, Nun, by the pen and by the record which men write. The word nun typically goes untranslated, but according to Muhammad's companions, including Ibn Abbas and Ibn Masud, it refers to a large fish or a whale. Ibn Abbas comments on Surah 68 verse 1, Allah swears by the nun, which is the whale that carries the earths on its back while in water, and beneath which is the bull, and under the bull is the rock, and under the rock is the dust, and none knows what is under the dust save Allah. We have many more references to this cosmic fish or whale in Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, and Al-Qurtubi. So, Surah 68 verse 1 contains a reference to a fish or whale beneath the seven earths. Yes, I said seven earths. In Surah 65 verse 12 we read, Allah is he who created seven heavens and of the earth the like of them. Modern Muslims have tried to reconcile Muhammad's reference to seven heavens and seven earths with a correct understanding of the universe, but in Jamiat Termidi 3298, Muhammad himself explained what the Quran is referring to. The seven heavens are seven domes over the earth, and there's a 500-year journey between one dome and the next. According to Surah 22 verse 65, these domes are made of some kind of physical substance that would fall on us if Allah didn't hold it up. The verse declares, He, Allah, withholds the heaven from falling on the earth, except with his permission. Most surely, Allah is compassionate, merciful to men. Allah withholds the heaven from falling on the earth. Just as there are seven heavens, there are seven earths, with ours, of course, on top. According to Muhammad, there's a 500-year journey between one earth and the next. The earths, the earths are stacked on top of each other, but with some space in between. What's the shape of these earths? According to the Quran, the earth is as flat as a carpet. Surah 20, verse 53, He who has made for you the earth like a carpet spread out. Surah 71, verse 19, And Allah has made the earth for you as a carpet spread out. Surah 88, 17 through 20, do they never reflect on the camels and how they were created, the heaven, how it was raised on high, the mountains, how they were set down, the earth, how it was made flat? But it's not only the top earth that's flat. We learn from Muhammad's companions that all seven earths are flat. Ibn Abbas comments on Surah 65, verse 12, Allah it is who hath created seven heavens, one above the other, like a dome, and of the earth, the like thereof, seven earths, but they are flat.
So if you're trying to get your mind around Muhammad's view of the seven Earths, just imagine a giant stack of pancakes, but there's some space between the pancakes. Muhammad's astronomical difficulties don't stop there. Muhammad clearly believed that it's the movement of the sun, not the rotation of the earth, that accounts for our observation of the sun moving across the sky. In Surah 36, verses 38 to 40, Allah says that the sun runs its course, that the sun and moon each swim along in their own orbits, and that the sun can't catch up to the moon. We know Muhammad believed that the sun is moving across the sky from other passages as well. For instance, Surah 18 tells us that Alexander the Great once reached the place where the sun sets. Verse 86 says, when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black, muddy water. Our Muslim friends try to reinterpret this. Unfortunately for them, in Sunan Abu Daud 3991, Muhammad also declared, that the sun sets in a pool of water. Since, since the sun uh, sets in a pool, the sun must not be very big, but the other heavenly bodies aren't very big either. Indeed, many of the stars we see are small enough to be flung at demons whenever these evil spirits overstep their bounds. According to several passages in the Quran, Stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into heaven. If you see a shooting star in the sky, it's because Allah became angry and hurled a star at a demon. In Surah 67, verse 5, for instance, Allah says, And we have from of old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil ones and have, pre and have prepared for them the penalty of the blazing fire. Now, there are some massive problems with Muhammad's view of stars. For First, it's extremely odd to claim that shooting stars, which are physical objects, are being hurled at evil spirits. Second, shooting stars aren't really stars. According to the Quran, however, Allah flings stars at demons, causing a bright streak across the sky. The Quran therefore identifies shooting stars as stars, which is simply wrong. Well, we've talked about the cosmic fish, the seven flat earths, the heavenly domes that might fall on us, the skinny dipping sun, and the stellar missiles. The only question that remains is, what's above the heavens? Muhammad tells us in Sunan Abu Daud 4705, where he tells his followers, above the seventh heaven, there is a sea, the distance between whose surface and bottom is like that between one heaven and the next. Above that, there are eight mountain goats, the distance between whose hoofs and haunches is like the distance between one heaven and the next. Then Allah, the blessed and the exalted, is above that. So, Muslims point to Muhammad's miraculously scientific statements as proof that Islam is true. But what exactly did Muhammad get right when he talked about the universe? Muhammad believed that there are seven earths, that's false, all of them flat, that's false, stacked on top of each other like pancakes, that's false, except with a long distance between them, that's false. Out on the edge of the top earth is a pool, that's false, where the sun sets, that's false. There are also seven heavens above the earths, that's false, and their domes that will fall on us if Allah doesn't hold them up, that's false. In the lowest heaven are the stars, which Allah uses to hurl at demons, that's false, and all of this is sandwiched between a giant fish, that's false, and eight giant goats, that's false. But Muhammad's scientific errors don't stop there. Let's turn to Muhammad's view of human reproduction. According to the Quran, Surah 86, verses 5 to 7, semen is formed somewhere between the backbone and the ribs. Muhammad adds in the Hadith that women produce semen just like men. Sahih Muslim 608. Man's discharge, i.e. sperm, is thick and white, and the discharge of woman is thin and yellow. In Sahih Muslim 3328, Muhammad says that the mother's semen is why a child sometimes resembles its mother. So both men and women produce semen. And according to Islam, reproduction begins when the thick white semen of a man mixes together with the thin yellow semen of a woman. In Sahih Muslim 3329, Muhammad claims to have received knowledge of this from the angel Gabriel, who, who told him that a child's appearance is determined by which parent ejaculates semen first. Any of you who've taken high school biology know that's not how it works. 
In Sahih Muslim 614, Muhammad claims that a child will be male if the semen of the man prevails, but that the child will be female if the semen of the woman prevails. This is total nonsense. The sex of a child, whether male or female, is determined by the sperm contributed by the man. Returning to Muhammad's stance on reproduction, once the male sperm mixes with the female sperm, development takes place rather slowly. The developing human spends a full 40 days as a collection of sperm, then spends another 40 days as a clot of blood. The various stages of Islamic developmental biology are put together for us in Surah 22, verse 5, Surah 40, verse 67, and Surah 23, verses 12 through 14 from the Quran, along with Muhammad's claims in Sahih Muslim 6393 and 6397 and Sahih al-Bukhari 3208. These passages yield a number of interesting insights. First, the earliest stage of human development is the sperm stage, which lasts for a period of 40 days. Second, the next stage is the blood clot stage, which also lasts around 40 days. Third, bones are formed before flesh. Fourth, the final stage of development is when Allah determines the sex of the child. All of these claims are false. Sperm can survive for about a week once they've been released, but they certainly don't last 40 days. There's no such thing as a blood clot stage, let alone one that represents a significant portion of early embryonic development. Bones don't form before flesh. Flesh and, flesh and bones develop at the same time, and a child's sex is determined genetically as soon as the sperm enters the egg. So this is Muhammad's view of human reproduction. Semen forms between the backbone and the ribs, wrong. Then it joins with the female semen, wrong. And whichever one is discharged first determines which parent the child will resemble, wrong. The child spends 40 days as a drop of sperm, wrong. Then the child spends another 40 days as a clot of blood, wrong. Then the child becomes a lump, wrong. Then the child becomes bones, wrong. Then the bones are wrapped with flesh, wrong, and after the final shape is determined, Allah finally decides whether the child will be male or female, wrong. Here we find, once again, that Muhammad got wrong pretty much everything he could possibly get wrong. But there are other scientific problems in the Muslim sources. Let's consider some of Muhammad's teachings and how they relate to personal hygiene and the spread of disease. In Surah 4, verse 3 of the Quran, Allah says that Muslims can marry up to four women. In Surah 4, verse 24, and many other passages, we find that Muslims are also allowed to have sex with their female captives. Now, let's say a Muslim has four wives. He's out waging jihad one day, he conquers a town, and he takes several female captives. According to the Quran, once he knows these women aren't pregnant, he can have sex with them. Now, as far as the spread of disease is concerned, is this a good idea or a bad idea? It's a very bad idea. If you start having sex with female captives and any one of those female captives has a disease, you're going to spread it to all of your wives. Then any children born will be affected. This is a horrible idea. So this teaching of the Quran can be disastrous to your health. What about the Hadith? Let's say you're a Muslim and you want to perform your ablutions. What sort of water should you use? In Sunan Abu Dawood 67, Muhammad tells his followers they can perform their ceremonial washings using water that has dead dogs, used menstrual cloths, and human excrement floating in it. He says, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. In Sunnah Ibn Majah 520, Muhammad tells his followers that it's okay to drink water with a dead donkey floating in it. In Sahih al-Bukhari 5782, Muhammad tells his followers that if a fly falls into their food, they should dip the fly into the food because one of the fly's wings has a disease while the other wing has the cure for the disease. In Musnad Ahmed 16,245, Muawiyah says, I saw the Prophet sucking on the tongue or the lips of Al-Hassan son of Ali, for no tongue or lips that the Prophet has sucked on will be tormented by hellfire. That's not hygienic. Now think about this. You're waging jihad one day and you capture some women. You don't know that the women are riddled with diseases, but you have sex with them anyway. Then you have sex with your wives and spread the disease to them. Then you suck on some poor kid's tongue and spread who knows what to him. You want to get ready for prayers, so you wash up using water that has used menstrual cloths and human feces floating in it. During dinner, a fly lands in your food, so you dunk that fly, not realizing that it's carrying typhoid. You start to get thirsty, so you grab a tall glass of dead donkey water. Now you start feeling sick because of all the diseases you got from following Muhammad's teachings. You get a bad stomach ache, and what's Muhammad's solution for your stomach problems? camel urine. Somehow Muslims look at all of this. They look at 
Muhammad's claims about the universe and Muhammad's claims about human reproduction and Muhammad's claims about disease and hygiene, and they say, Alhamdulillah, this proves that Muhammad was a true prophet. But what did Muhammad get right? Nothing that any six-year-old couldn't have told him. And how do our Muslim friends deal with Muhammad's absurd scientific claims? The miracle of reinterpretation. Whenever Muhammad said something that's obviously scientifically false, they simply reinterpret it. And it's one thing if they reinterpret the clear claims of their prophet, but they expect us to reinterpret his claims as well. So the real Muslim argument here goes something like this. You unbelievers should believe that Muhammad was a true prophet, because if you go to the Quran and to the teachings of Muhammad, and you reinterpret them every time there's a clear scientific error, you won't find any scientific errors. And if there are no scientific errors, then Muhammad must be a true prophet. But you could use that exact same reasoning to prove that anyone is a prophet. And as a rule, if your argument could be used to show that anyone is a prophet, you probably need a new argument. Thank you very much for that opening statement from David Wood. We're going to jump into the rebuttals. But I've got to say, folks, if you haven't yet, consider hitting the share button. Because if you're enjoying this debate, there's one way in which you can, you can say the completion of the joy in something is sharing it with somebody else. The way you talk about somebody you love and you say, oh, they're so beautiful and tremendous, is you can hit that share button and share this debate with somebody right now who enjoys these debates as well. And that share button is just down below. The rebuttals are 10 minutes each, so we're going to kick it over to Nadir. Thanks so much. The floor is all yours, Nadir. Thank you so much for that. So I believe this debate is over. In a nervous fit, David Wood shotgun blasted us with hundreds of alleged scientific contradictions in the, in the Quran and Hadith and things like that. And before I address him, I want to first say thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, that I, you have given me the opportunity now to debunk every single one of these claims. But wait a second, if these claims are really real, you had a simple challenge. Remember my prophecy I said, David Wood is going to go down just like the apostate prophet. You All you have to do is just bring one scientific URL, match it up with the Quran, whether it's murky waters or whatever you brought up, and show the contradiction. You will never be able to do so. And that's something, uh, uh, you know, spectacular about the Quran, because you could do that with the Bible. You could do that with other books, but you cannot do that with the Holy Quran. So what he basically did in a nervous fit to my opening presentation, he shotgun blasted us. This is what we call a born again pepper spray attack. And I've just been victimized by a, a flurry of alleged scientific contradictions. There's no way I'm gonna be able to answer all that in tonight's debate. So listen, if you don't hear an answer from me on these specific points, if, if I miss some, it's not because we don't have an answer, it's because I got victimized by a, by a born again pepper spray attack. Why? Because David Wood, has ran away from every single argument in my opening presentation. I have pointed out that Prophet Muhammad lifted the curse placed on the, from the, a biblical curse placed on mankind from the Bible. I've shown you examples of that. In fact, let me go ahead and share my, my desktop because, um, you know, he, he said, oh, well, Muhammad got everything factually incorrect. But I showed you from, from science today that science has recognized that the, if you look at the way Muhammad responded, his answer on fetal alcohol syndrome, it's 50 times, they are 50 times less likely to give birth to a fetal alcohol child. That's a really good answer, David. So, and, I, and let me get the study in front of you because I want to make sure that you retract your statement. You said, I believe your statement was, and I'm quoting you, he said he got everything possibly wrong. I'm quoting you from uh, from the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. They're showing that the Islamic answer is superior than the biblical answer. Now, I want you to take 10 seconds of my time and retract your statement that whatever Muhammad spoke on, he just got it wrong. Can you please take 10 seconds of my time? And um, retract your statement. Is my audio on? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the fetal alcohol syndrome? No, Muhammad's soldiers started showing up drunk when they had things to do and people started showing up uh, drunk for prayers and so on. He forbade alcohol. If you want to say that there's uh -huh. some other, some other good consequence of that, you can say that. But yeah. where does Muhammad say that he's forbidding yeah. alcohol because of 
Okay, thank you. Thank Fetal you. alcohol okay. syndrome. Uh, so, uh, see, this, the, what we're showing over here is science gave a, is telling us that Islam gave a scientifically superior answer than Christianity. This is big. This is huge. Nowhere did you show that the, from a scientific perspective, the perspective you gave us is not science. Something about some drunk soldiers. I don't even know what you're talking about, to be very honest with you. So, as we can see, my, well, the problem here is that the Christian answer is horrible. What makes Muhammad a true prophet, David, is it is a scientifically superior answer than what Jesus gave you. So you were not able to address why, uh, why you know, why we see such a great answer coming from Prophet Muhammad. So again, when you hear David would say, "Oh well, you see, Muhammad, whatever he got out of science, he got it wrong." We can all just, like I said, just smile, nod your head. And like, okay, sure, David, sure. So before I, I start knocking out these alleged scientific contradictions, I want to make something very clear. When I address you on those alleged scientific errors, that's going to be the victory lap of this debate, because I think the debate is over now. As I have proved consecutively, clearly, that the Prophet Muhammad, he alleviates the misery and suffering. He will lift the curse of biblical Christianity from mankind. And if you have any doubt that there is a curse placed upon these people, look at this. This is just right from CNN.com. Here is a child chugging wine, and Christians think it's cute. Children drinking alcohol, that's a curse. Why? We know from science, and I'm quoting... I don't know. Okay, I'm quoting over here. It tells us over here that children who drink wine, they become more sexually active, they have more sexual partners, and they and they take more risk-taking behavior. Islam gives a far better answer than what Jesus does. And the problem here is, is that prophet is that Jesus, what's it called? I'm sorry, um, is the Bible creates the conditions for this horrible catastrophe, which you fail to address, as you can see on the screen over here. So let's go ahead and let's knock out some of these alleged scientific errors which you have shown, uh, which you have tried to claim inside the Quran. He said, okay, the sun goes down in a pool of murky waters. He said, you see, this is uh, a scientific contradiction. Well, let me first of all say, if the Quran said that the sun goes in a pool of murky water, that makes the Quran wrong. Okay. Now, what did I say in my opening presentation? Telling us where, well, of course it doesn't, and I'll give you the explanation. Telling us that the, there are scientific contradictions in the Quran. No, that does not invalidate all the evidence which I have presented to you. And that's a deception which you are trying to present to us. It doesn't make my evidence disappear. No, Muhammad is still a prophet, but we can use the Judeo-Christian error reconciliations. We can say, oh, really, there's an error? Uh, okay, see, Muhammad was a human being also. So as a human being, he made an error. That's not my response. But what I'm showing you is David Wood wasted his time trying to show contradictions in the Quran and Hadith when that will not determine, uh, it will not overrule the verdict. The verdict is that science has positively identified Prophet Muhammad as a true prophet because only a true prophet can correct Four, so how I many? I think it was four scientific contradictions, and gives a scientifically correct answer, winning the recognition of the of the uh, of the scientific community. How can a man, an illiterate man, fourteen hundred years ago, win the recognition, win so many awards? We've shown you from the from Red uh, Red Crescent. I'm sorry, Red Cross. I've shown you from WHO. I've shown you from so many peer-reviewed journals recognizing Muhammad for the scientific contra uh, contributions. Only a true prophet of God. Of, uh, can do that. Okay, let me get to the alleged scientific errors. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, if the Quran says that the sun goes in the pool of murky waters, Quran is incorrect. But that's not what the Quran said. It said it taghrib in a pool of murky waters, and there's a distinct difference between the two. Okay, so let us go to let us. And, he, and I believe you also quoted the hadith. This will here we see uh, taghrib is used over here. Jala Sheikh uh, the. Uh, we go to the classical uh, commentary and we quote Jalalain as he explains what this word means in Arabic. It says, it's described as seen from the perspective of the eye. Did you see that in his commentary? So he's giving you the explanation here. Nobody ever said that the sun physically enters into, the, uh, into a pool of murky waters. So is it okay to say the sun taghrib in water? Perfectly fine. It's wrong to say it goes into a pool of murky waters. Now let us go to the Prophet Muhammad himself. He says, do you know where the sun goes? 
Uh oh. Now that if you look at the text over there, that's physically going into a pool of murky water. Remember what I said. If Muhammad said it goes into a pool, it goes into a pool of murky water. Quran is wrong. Muhammad is wrong. Okay. Look what he says over here. He says, "Do you know where the sun goes?" He says, and he continues. He says it goes under the throne of Allah. But look what he doesn't say. He doesn't say it goes into a pool of murky water. So the Prophet Muhammad himself is explaining the difference between going into a pool of murky water versus taghreb in a pool of murky water. And then he's and then it's the hadith ends. You got to go to chapter number thirty-six, verse thirty-eight, to see where the sun physically goes. So here we see that the alleged scientific error has been debunked over here. So I, I, I would look forward to how hearing his response to this. And then he tried to quote uh, the Ibn Abbas. He said Ibn Abbas uh, basically said that it's on the back of a whale or the earth on the back of a wheel. But by doing that, he's giving the rope to hang him with. See, he found a scientific error, but it's in the commentary why can we not find that scientific error in the quran so by you going to the commentary and finding a scientific error it only strengthens the case that the quran is in complete harmony with modern science because now he needs to answer why can we not find these scientific errors which you did find in the commentary because if quran is not from allah you will have those kind of errors like you showed us today but in the commentaries yes there is scientific errors and you will never find that in the holy quran so uh, my time is up i'll address the rest of these alleged errors at a late, uh, when i come back up with that we're going to jump over into david's first rebuttal which is also 10 minutes thanks so much david the floor is all yours Thank you, James. Uh, in my opening statement, I gave an overview of Muhammad's claims about the universe, about human reproduction, uh, and about disease and personal hygiene. We saw that Muhammad got wrong just about everything he could possibly get wrong. Muhammad believed that there are seven Earths, that all of them are flat, that they're stacked on top of each other like pancakes, except with a long distance between them. He believed that out on the edge of the top pool is a pool. Uh, at the edge of the top earth is a pool where the sun sets. He believed that there are seven earths, I mean, seven heavens above the seven earths, and that there are domes that will fall on us if Allah doesn't hold them up. He believed that in the lowest heaven are the stars, which Allah uses to hurl at demons, and he believed that all of this is sandwiched between a giant fish and eight giant goats. What did Muhammad get right here? Nothing, as far as I can tell, except like that there is a sun and that there is a moon and things like that. Um, how did Nadir respond? He said that the fish or whale issue isn't a scientific error because it's a commentary and uh, Muhammad didn't mention it in the Quran. But it, Surah 68 verse 1 does refer to the Nun. It's Muhammad's companions, such as Ibn Abbas, the founder of Quranic studies, and Ibn Masud, the man that Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from him. And they're the ones who tell us what the word nun refers to. It refers to this giant fish. Uh, and the seven earths are on top of its back. So this is, these are Muhammad's companions. And they're saying something about this, referring to a fish. Where do they get this idea? The people who learned the Quran directly from Muhammad tell us what this is referring to. And Nadir says, ah, yes, well, if it's a scientific error for them, then it's not a problem. But these are the guys who are learning the Quran from Muhammad. And they're saying something very similar. They're saying something about this referring to a giant fish or whale. So looks like a problem. Um, Nadir says that what the what the Quran means when it says that the sun sets in a muddy pool is that it simply appears that the sun sets in a muddy pool. And he says that this is what Muhammad means in the Hadith, but that's not what Muhammad said. There, there's When Muhammad talks about it, he's not talking about Muslims seeing anything or anyone seeing anything as an appearance. He tells his companion where the sun actually goes when it sets. Let me read, let me read for you. Sunan Abu Dawud, 3991. Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the apostle of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. He's not saying anything about what we're going to see. He simply, he simply says to one of his companions, you know where the sun is going. His companion says, I don't, you're the prophet. 
And what does Muhammad say? It sets in a, it sets in a spring, it sets in a spring of water. Now, if, if you're going to simply reinterpret that, then yes, uh, you can reinterpret anything you want. So th those were all of the responses I gathered from the issues of Muhammad's view of the universe. What do we have next? Uh, Muhammad believed that semen forms between the backbone and the ribs, that it mixes with the female semen, and that whichever parent, uh, whichever parent semen is discharged first determines which parent the child will resemble. Muhammad believed that the child spends 40 days as a drop of sperm, that the child then spends another 40 days as a clot of blood, that the child then becomes a lump and then becomes bones, and that the bones are then wrapped with flesh. He believed that after the final shape is determined, Allah finally decides whether the child will be male or female. What did Muhammad get right here? Uh, nothing, and I didn't catch any response from Nadir, but maybe I missed it. When it comes to hygiene and the spread of disease, Muhammad told his followers to dunk flies in their food, and he thought it was fine to wash up using water that was filled with human waste and to drink water with dead animals floating in it. Uh, what did Muhammad get right here? Nothing as far as I can tell. Um, in here again, if Nadir offered any sort of response, I must have missed it. Once again, our Muslim friends are free to reinterpret the words of their prophet, but they can't expect us to reinterpret the words of their prophet when they're supposed to be giving us evidence for their prophet. Muhammad was the most obvious false prophet in history, so why should we do him any favors here? Now, um, I think we can say that when it comes to Muhammad's view of the universe, Muhammad's view of human reproduction, Muhammad's view of uh, personal hygiene and the spread of disease, there are a ton, a ton of scientific blunders here. What has Nadir given us as his main argument? Well, Nadir attacks Jesus and the Bible. Now, this is interesting because uh, I have here this sealed document, this sealed document that I wrote beforehand. I'm going to open this sealed document. And since Nadir thanked me, I had already anticipated and I wrote a thank you card. I wrote a thank you card. And in my thank you card, I write, I prophesy, Nadir will use this debate to attack the Bible. There you have it, folks. <laughs> I'm a more accurate prophet than Muhammad has ever been. How did I know? Well, that seems to be the goal of Muslim apologists. They will challenge, challenge us to a debate on the Quran in order to attack the Bible. Um, what's the problem here? Well, Nadir is saying that there's the curse of Jesus, the curse of the Bible, and it's put this curse upon the world, and that Muhammad came to, uh, to, to get us out of this curse. But what did Muhammad say when he talked about Jesus? Muhammad affirmed that Jesus spoke the truth, that we have to believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're in trouble. You say, well, maybe, the, maybe Jesus' teachings have been corrupted. Well, Muhammad affirmed the inspiration, the preservation, and the authority of the gospel that Christians still have. Allah orders us in the Quran, Surah 5, verse 47, to judge by what Allah has revealed in the gospel. Surah 5, verse 68 says that we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. Muhammad in the Hadith said that affirmed that Jews still have the Torah, and that Christians still have the gospel. And he affirmed it in a way that shows it's the same way that Muslims have the Quran. So, um, if Nadir is correct, if, and since this debate isn't about the Bible or about Jesus, if Nadir is correct and we just grant everything that he's saying, and we say Jesus was horribly, horribly mistaken and wrong in everything that he ever said about science, and the Bible is completely wrong, well, those are the scriptures, and that is the man that Muhammad affirmed. So Muhammad affirmed the inspiration, preservation, and authority uh, of the gospel that Christians still have. So in addition to all of the scientific blunders that I pointed out, Nadir's prophet also affirmed the inspiration, preservation, and authority of a book which, according to Nadir, is filled with scientific blunders. So Muhammad made a ton of scientific blunders, and if Nadir is correct about Jesus and the Bible, Muhammad also affirmed Jesus and the Bible. So if Muhammad would be affirming all of those scientific blunders as well. Uh, what else do we have? We have the issue of fetal alcohol syndrome, syndrome that uh, if, since Islam condemns alcohol, 
because again, Muhammad's people were, were showing up drunk to prayers and so on. If, if the Quran condemns uh, alcohol, then anything that happens as a result of that is Islam giving a true scientific teaching. But notice, um, alcohol, alcohol uh, can have positive impacts on health. So for instance, if it can lower your rate of uh, heart disease and things like that. So notice, n imagine a world where I walk into a debate and I say, Christianity allows alcohol with moderation. Islam forbids alcohol. But alcohol can lower the rate of heart disease. But Islam doesn't allow you to have that health benefit. Therefore, Christianity is true and it saves us from the scourge of Islam. That would be absolutely ridiculous reasoning. Um, the only the only way you can make any sort of scientific argument for that is if you know if if the Bible is saying here's why it is it and, and uh, it actually lowers the rate of heart disease or something like that. So what we have is Nadir uh, saying that Islam forbids alcohol and uh, therefore anything that happens from alcohol that's negative, well, Islam saved us from that. Um, and this is just a very strange, very horrible argument. Certainly not something that would outweigh all of the scientific blunders. Again, Muhammad's view of the universe, Muhammad's view of uh, human reproduction, uh, Muhammad's view of the spread of disease and personal hygiene and so on. All, everything he says is completely ridiculous. And Nadir is saying, well, Muhammad didn't like his people drunk, therefore it's a miracle. Um, okay, so if following this reasoning, anyone who forbids alcohol would have to be a prophet, and that's going to be a lot of new prophets. Thanks, Nadir. Thank you for that. We're going to jump into the second rebuttals. These are actually going to be seven minutes long, so a bit shorter. And want to remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. So if you want to hear more from David Wood, if you want to hear more from Nadir, you can learn about their views by clicking on their links in the description box below. And we always put our guest links in the podcast episode description box as well, in case you're listening via podcast. With that, thanks so much, Nadir. The floor is all yours. Yeah, so uh, as I said, the debate is basically over. Let me first address his uh, the little letter which he wrote to himself about using the Bible. So you see, David, I think you're misunderstanding the argument being presented to you. So uh, you are actually attacking a straw man. So let me go ahead and clarify it for you. You see, the issue is this. What makes Muhammad a true prophet is that Jesus spoke on certain topics, washing hands, alcohol, um, uh, meat consumption, you know, and, and, and a whole variety of others. Prophet Muhammad comes back and talks about those same exact things. And he gives a scientifically superior answer than that of what Jesus brought. That is what makes Muhammad a true prophet, number one. Number one, he alleviates the misery and suffering caused by the teachings of Christ. For example, I've shown you from the research over here that Muslim women are 50 times less likely to give birth to a fetal alcohol child. I also showed you that, that when I talk about the curse, uh, you know, I, I showed you a child drinking, chugging wine in a, in, in a, in a, uh, in a church. That's a curse I'm talking about. You know, the Bible creates the conditions for this type of for for this type of catastrophes catastrophes to happen here, so I'm not saying okay. Look, the Bible. This is the Bible has scientific errors. In fact, I even said just because the Bible has scientific errors, that doesn't automatically make it wrong. It doesn't automatically disprove the divinity of Christ. I still believe in the Bible in spite of all of its scientific errors. You see, so for you to come tonight and tell us, oh, but Islam has all these scientific errors, which of course is very easy to debunk. Listen. I can't, he, he pepper sprayed me with hundreds of points. Nobody, I, I lack the superhuman capability. I'm not a Superman to address every single point. Like I told you, you'll never get the opportunity to address every single one. But since you have misrepresented the argument and you have given us pseudoscientific claims, I need to correct you. But before I do that on, on alcohol, I wanna, I wanna, every time you say, Muhammad got everything wrong, let me light you up with some scientific references. This is from, uh, from the WHO. Again, I'm quoting from the most prestigious uh, peer-reviewed journals in which they praise Prophet Muhammad on washing his on washing hands before you eat and clipping the nails. Direct 
word for word agreement with modern science. So I will give you a second opportunity. I'm showing you the science right here, and I'm showing you word for word agreement with modern science. David, for you to continue to say, oh, Muhammad got everything wrong on science. It's right here in front of you. Let us read again what science says. It says the prophet Muhammad always urged Muslims to wash hands frequently, and especially after some clearly defined tasks. Now, let me quote for you. Uh, let me let me go back and address you on your pseudoscientific claims, which you are making tonight. You say, oh, you see, there's some good in alcohol. It basically helps your heart or some something like that. So let us go back to the science, uh, what science really says about that. It says, and I'm quoting, many studies have shown, this is an article from CNN. It says, many studies have shown that the overall health risk of drinking alcohol outweighs any benefit. Did you see that? The overall, uh, you know, health risk of drinking alcohol outweighs any benefits. There's no amount of alcohol is good for your overall health. So this, I will ask for you to retract your pseudoscientific claim that all oh, you see is good for your heart. When you go into the doctor's office, they're not going to ask you, have you had some beer? Oh, you need beer. Come, where's your... No, this is pseudoscience which you are presenting to us. Now, remember, David was that Muhammad got everything wrong he could possibly get. Look at what look at what Muhammad says about alcohol inside the following verse, chapter two, verse two nineteen. They have some benefit for people, but their harm is far greater than their benefit. Word for word agreement with modern science. So here's the second example of he said, this is just being reinterpreted. Is this being reinterpreted? It's right here in front of you. Science juxtaposed with, with what with the Holy Quran, complete harmony with modern science. So you should retract your false statement. When you said he got everything possibly wrong, you are seeing right here that, <laughs> that it is word for word agreement with modern science. Allahu Akbar. So let's go back to the issue of murky waters. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, David Wood has a misunderstanding on, on the Quran. So let's consider it's like a learning experience for all of us. You see, David, there's a distinct difference between saying the, that, the, that the sun taghrib in water and saying it physically goes into the water. As I have shown you from Jalalain, he has already explained all of this. Let me get that reference for you right here. To say that the Quran pilgrims in water is perfectly scientifically correct. There's nothing wrong with that because it really, here we see from, from Jalalain over here, it says, it is described as seen from the perspective of the eye. I've also quoted you a hadith. The prophet Muhammad explains all this stuff. He said, do you know where the sun physically grows? See, that's where it physically goes. Look what Muhammad doesn't say. He doesn't say it goes into a pool of murky waters. You see? So he, are you going to follow Muhammad or are you going to follow David Wood? <laughs> you know, so I think this is, um, you know, I don't know if you can read the text over here, but I'll assume you can. But this is a dead argument. The, to say that the sun, uh, that the sun tagrid in water is perfectly fine. There's no contradiction with science over there. And then finally, he said tonight, um, in fact, in fact, let me uh, let me scroll up. Yeah, he said something about he, ex he accepted. OK, well, the whole thing about on the back of a whale, uh, he conceded, OK, that's a commentary. But then he said, but these are your most premier scholars. They're so great. And so here we see this is a goalpost shift. He's shifting the goalpost. Now he's bringing up another goal controversy. Why do your premier scholars, why are they wrong? You know, nobody believes in the, in the infallibility of these people. But he has conceded tonight that about the back of the whale, this is not in the Quran. And this is a death blow for him. Why? Because now he needs to answer, why can we not find scientific errors in the Quran? You can find it in the commentary. You can find it in the Bible. You will never find it in the Quran. Regarding the whole issue about the flat earth, again, guys, you know, I'm not a Superman where I can address every single, you know, argument or something like that. Give me time and I will address all of that. So why is Muhammad a true prophet? Well, it's very simple. He is the one who is basically going to alleviate the misery and suffering caused by the teachings of Christ. And I will ask for you to retract your, your pseudoscientific claim that uh, you know there's some good in alcohol, as I've shown you word for word agreement. And I'm still waiting for you to accept this challenge Time. where you need to defend Jesus on not washing his hands. Go ahead. 
Thank you very much. We're going to kick it over to David for his seven-minute rebuttal as well. And this is right before we go into the more open conversation mode, where it'll be two minutes mm-hmm. back and forth. But I've got the clock reset for you, David. Seven minutes. The floor is all yours. Oh, that's right. I muted you. Sorry about that. All good. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So I... Uh, went through Muhammad's view of the universe, and if you want a fun challenge, try to come up with an, with a more absurd view of the universe than the one Muhammad had. Uh, how does Nadir respond? Um, he says, again, that the, uh, the position of Muhammad's companions that the nun of Surah 68 is referring to a giant fish or whale, he says this doesn't matter because they're the companions, but if Muhammad's companions are agreeing that this refers to a fish or a whale, where are they coming up with that? These are the same guys who learned the Quran from Muhammad. Is Nadir saying that they were just making things up about the Quran? Um, at the best case scenario, absolute best case scenario, uh, Nadir would have to say that the Quran is just completely confusing and doesn't explain what it means there. What 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 is the what is the nun? What what is what is that talking about? Right. Muhammad's companions tell us, and it's scientifically absurd. Um, Nadir says that Tafsir Jalalain claims that Surah 18 verse 86 says that it, it refers to the appearance. Yeah, Tafsir Jalalain was written at a time when they knew that it was absolutely absurd to say that the sun sets in a muddy pool. Not surprising that Jalalain would start reinterpreting these things just as Muslims do today. Um, but if you're going with Tafsir Jalalain and his com- and their commentary, the two Jalals, uh, Nadir said that he'll respond to the flat earth, but Jalalain says that it the, the earth is definitely flat, and he draws uh, a contrast between what scientists are saying and what the Quran says and what, what the experts in Islamic law say. And he says that the word used there, suttahat, because keep in mind, this is Nadir saying that you can trust Tafsir Jalalain when it says what the word in the Quran means. Tafsir, Tafsir Jalalain says that the word suttahat, made flat, shows that the earth is flat and not round, as astronomers say. So, if Nadir's going with the commentary there, uh, good. Um, But on the issue, on the issue of claiming that all that the Quran is saying here is that the sun appears, like if you were beside a body of water, the sun might appear to be going into the water when it actually isn't. Uh, again, he's contradicting his prophet. I thought Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran. I thought he's the he's the walking Quran. Sunan Abu Dawud 3991. Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the apostle of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. This isn't talking about anything they're seeing. They're not seeing a spring. They're in a desert. They're not seeing some sort of spring. Muhammad is telling his companion who doesn't know where the earth sets, I mean, where the sun sets, he's telling him where the sun sets. And he says it sets in a spring of water. It can't simply be referring to uh, the appearance of the sun setting in, in a spring or something like that, because companions of Muhammad would know that. They would know that, hey, if the, the, the sun looks like it's setting, I mean, if all you see on the horizon is desert, it would look like the sun is setting in, into a desert. Um, if you were beside a body of water, it would look like the sun is setting in a body of water. Muhammad doesn't say this is some sort of appearance. He says, I'm telling you where the sun is going when you can't see it anymore. And he says it goes into a, uh, into a pool of water. Um, so we have no reason to think that Muhammad got anything right about the universe. What about Muhammad's view of human reproduction? There, he got everything wrong as well and haven't seen any response from Nadir. What about Muhammad's view of disease and personal hygiene? Um, Well, Nadir didn't respond to the things I brought up, but he keeps pointing out that the World Health Organization praises Muhammad for telling people to wash their hands. Now, keep in mind, Muhammad's just copying the pagans here. The pagans performed ablutions. These aren't, these aren't, these aren't health washings. There's these ceremonial washings. Uh, and again, the, the pagans were doing it. So according to Nadir, 
the pagans must have been prophets because they were doing the exact same thing. But what did Muhammad actually say? Muhammad said that water is not made impure by anything. It doesn't matter if it's got human waste in it. It doesn't matter if a dead animal is floating in it. So Nadir, please quote me, the World Health Organization, saying that even if there's a dead animal or a dead dog or a dead donkey or used menstrual cloths or human feces floating in a pool of water, it's perfectly safe to use, uh, it's perfectly safe to drink, perfectly safe to use in your washings because water is not made impure by anything. Then we will have a scientific miracle on our hands. Um, so Nadir's main argument, he says, is that what makes Muhammad a true prophet is that Jesus spoke on certain things and got them wrong. Muhammad spoke on the same issues and gave superior scientific answers. Well, we've seen Muhammad's view of the universe. We've seen Muhammad's view of reproduction. We've seen Muhammad's view of personal hygiene. Um, it's all absurd, as far as I can tell. Um, Nadir continues with the issue of uh, alcohol, that if Muhammad condemned alcohol because he didn't want people showing up drunk for prayer, this must mean that any good benefit that ever comes about because of that is, uh, is because Muhammad was making an accurate scientific claim. Muhammad's not making a scientific claim there. Muhammad's not saying, here's my scientific claim about the, you know, about alcohol and its, and its impact on, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome and things like that. Muhammad says, stop, stop drinking alcohol. And we know what the historical background there is. So what's the miracle here? He's, Nadir says, ah, I'm not explaining this miracle. Uh, Muhammad wasn't making a scientific claim. And this is, this is my point. When Muhammad is making scientific claims, like the sun setting in a muddy pool, like stars being missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons, like there being seven earths that are stacked up, that the heavens would fall on the earth if Allah wasn't holding them up, uh, that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. Uh, when Muhammad, that, that there are two semens, the female semen and the male semen, and they mix together and so on. When Muhammad is making scientific claims, he's wrong. And when he says something about alcohol and he's not even making a scientific claim, suddenly that gets reinterpreted as a scientific claim and shown as a miracle. And I just have to say, you could do this for anyone in history. Find anyone in history you could show that he's a prophet using the exact same method Nadir is using. Thank you very much for that rebuttal. We're going to kick into two minute intervals for open discussion for about 40 minutes. So, thank you very much. Gentlemen, reminder, folks, our guests are linked in the description, and that includes if you're listening to this episode via the Modern Day Debate podcast, as we put our guest links there as well. Thanks so much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Okay, so I'll go ahead for two minutes. So my, my response is clear. Give me a break. He say, I did not hear Nadir talk about, you know, all these issues, semen in the backbone, flat earth, all the, well, yeah, because I lack the superhuman, superman-like capabilities to address all of these um, alleged scientific errors. <laughs> you know, so take, I, you know, give me one at a time and we'll address that. So what we are seeing here is a nervous panic from David Wood. He pepper sprayed us. This is called a born again pepper spray attack. He pepper sprayed us with all kinds of bogus points. Listen, if you don't hear me respond on a particular issue, it's not because I'm not able to, or there's really an error. I'm not Superman, <laughs> you know? So let me go ahead and, uh, you know, address what makes prophet Muhammad a true prophet. Then I will refute you on every one of these alleged scientific errors, I promise. So what makes prophet Muhammad is a true prophet? See, David, you, you, on the issue of alcohol, you did not retract your false statement about the heart and you see there's good things in there and stuff like that. We found word for word agreement in, uh, with what we find in the Quran. The whole thing about pure waters, this is a goalpost shift, okay? From a scientific perspective, no way did you show that the, Jesus spoke about alcohol, but how is that any better than what Muhammad brought? I showed you in light of all you claim that, well, Muhammad is really just, you know, because he saw some people drunk. That's the reason why he condemned alcohol. There's a reinterpretation game right there. OK, you are reinterpreting the text. OK, but even from a scientific perspective, who cares? The fact remains that in spite of all the problems on alcohol, and let's just stick with alcohol, finish that then move to the next point. I don't think it, I think it's undeniable 
that it is a scientifically superior answer uh, than what Jesus gave. You claim that Jesus gave a better answer, then show us the documentation. And that's really what we're missing from you. Show us how Jesus gave a better answer scientifically on alcohol than Muhammad. You know, I have shown you where children are drinking alcohol, you know, and they think it's cute. No, it's not. That's a curse. I've shown you that when in the study they said if you want to learn the fetal alcohol syndrome issue you got to go to the christians that's a curse muhammad removes all of this with his response and that is what is written inside the scientific documentation so i think that's my two minutes right uh, james so the question i'm going to ask you let's take one issue at a time show me how jesus's answer on alcohol is better than muhammad's um there's no need because I think it's a ridiculous argument that you're making. Your argument is if Muhammad gave a superior answer to Jesus, then Muhammad would be a true prophet. Absolutely ridiculous. So, so take take a uh, uh, an issue like Islam allowing child marriage. Right? Do you hear the facts about child marriage? When a man gets a young girl pregnant, he's putting both the girl and her baby at risk. Rates of toxemia, sepsis, obstructed and prolonged labor, hemorrhaging, and fistulas all increase significantly for very young mothers. The babies born to these mothers have higher rates of infant mortality, premature birth, and low birth weight. So, following Nadir's reasoning here, following Nadir's reasoning, anyone who comes after Muhammad and gives a scientifically superior claim to that, right? Like anyone who comes along and says, hey, don't have sex with a girl until she's fully mature, um, that person must be a true prophet. Is that a good argument? I mean, I mean, are we going to believe that anyone who gives a better answer than Muhammad on that issue, or anyone who gives a better answer than Muhammad on uh, what stars are, or anyone who gives a better answer on the issue of uh, the sun setting in a pool, or anyone who gives a you better... You want me to answer? Shall uh, I answer? No, using my two minutes, I've been oh, interrupting. Um, or anyone who, uh, I mean, or, or that semen is formed between the backbone and ribs, anyone who comes along after Muhammad and gives a, a scientifically superior answer to Muhammad must be a true prophet. Here's the thing. No Muslim in the world would accept that argument. No Muslim in the world would accept that argument for Joseph Smith or for any person claiming to be a prophet today, even though any prophet who claims, anyone who claims to be a prophet today would be giving a superior answer to Muhammad. And so you'd reject the argument for anyone else, and yet you expect us to believe it for Muhammad. Okay, so again, let's deal with one issue at a time. I'm not Superman. Okay, so the whole issue about child marriage and getting pregnant, easy to debunk, but let's take let's take one issue at a time. So Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, David Wood does concede, and he does not have the scientific references to even begin to argue the claim that Jesus gave a superior answer to Muhammad. But he says, listen, if a man came after Prophet Muhammad and gave a better answer than Muhammad on the issue of alcohol, would that make, or, or whatever the issue, would that make that person a, a prophet? Well, if it was just that one issue, I would probably say no. But here's the problem. If the answer on alcohol, which Muhammad gave, actually caused physical deformities in children, like we saw with the case of Jesus, if you saw the imams are giving alcohol to drink to little children, which we know makes them more sexually active, makes them have more sexual partners, here comes another guy who fixes that. That's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a big problem. But again, what makes Muhammad a true prophet is just not one isolated incident. We are talking about, I think, five scientific corrections. So again, going back to the issue, if it's just alcohol, let's not make that conclusion that Muhammad is a true prophet based on that. But what that does do, that debunks the divinity of Jesus. How it does? Because how do you explain that an alleged false prophet gives a scientifically superior answer than the very Lord and Savior himself. And he's supposed to be a false prophet. And so that debunks the divinity of Christ, that debunks Christianity, because that never happens. But is Muhammad a true prophet at this point? No, because as David pointed out, uh, it can happen naturally, something like this. Okay, so the next point which I'm going to bring up is you need to defend 
Jesus on the issue of washing hands. W washing hands before uh, you eat, it made Jesus enraged in a fit of rage. So you need to defend Jesus and condemn Muslims for washing okay. their hands. Over to David. Uh, I still don't think Nadir is understanding anything I'm saying at all. Uh, I don't have to defend Jesus at all in a debate about whether the whether science shows that Muhammad was a true prophet. Jesus is talking about ceremonial washings. Again, Muhammad, in, in Muhammad's ceremonial washings, you could use uh, you could use bathroom toilet water that's filled with urine and feces to perform your ablutions. Um, you could still do ceremonial washings. It's just not hygienic. Uh, Jesus is saying that uh, that these ceremonial washings that they thought made someone ritually impure um, don't actually make someone ritually impure. That's a man-made teaching. This is, he's not even addressing the issue of hygiene. But guess what? Completely irrelevant. So suppose, for argument's sake, we say Jesus was completely wrong. Every, let's say, for argument's sake, Jesus was wrong about everything he ever said about science. What does that have to do with Muhammad being confirmed by science? According to Nadir, uh, Muhammad gave a better answer. So notice the reasoning. If someone comes along later and gives a better scientific answer, that person must be a true prophet. My question is, do you actually believe that? Because any six-year-old today, anyone who's, anyone who's in first grade, would give scientifically superior answers to the ones that Muhammad has given about the universe, about human reproduction, uh, about hygiene. Any six-year-old would give scientifically superior answers to Muhammad. So if some six-year-old said, hey, I am a true prophet and um, I'm going to tell you about the sun and I'm going to tell you what stars are and I'm going to tell you where semen is formed and so on and gives scientifically superior answers. Would Nadir accept this as evidence that any of these any of these six year olds are true prophets? No, of course he wouldn't. And yet we're supposed to accept this argument for Muhammad. Once again, if, if your argument shows that anyone is a prophet, probably need a new argument. Uh, okay, so now you are conceding that, okay, you well, the problem here, you are not able to defend the Lord and Savior himself from when he got angry at people washing their hands, not washing their hands before they eat. As you can see, it's an indefensible scientific error of the Bible. But like you said, this is really not the issue that the Bible uh, you know, contradict science. But what if a six-year-old could do that, as David would say? Would you accept him as a prophet? Well, what I would say, that is something absolutely amazing. Because a man or a six-year-old, 1,400 years ago, how would he be able to know what are the scientific contradictions of the Bible and give a scientifically superior answer than that of the Bible? Now, so you have conceded for a second time tonight that, yes, on the issue of washing hands, Muhammad gave a scientifically superior answer, and any doubt about that, I did quote, quote the WHO as well as other articles praising Muhammad for not just washing hands, David, it's washing your hands and clipping your nail, word for word agreement with modern science, Allahu Akbar. Now, I got some time where I can issue the whole thing about dirty waters, dead animals in it, or something like that. So let me go ahead and respond to that. Muhammad asked, you know, basically the whole thing about dirty animals and drinking water in it. I will give you the, C the CBN article. The water which you are referring to is drunken by millions of people all over the world. That is because there is no other water. As you can see from the reference which I'm presenting to you, this is a CBN article. Let me quote this little girl. It says, drinking water with dead animals in it. There, we have to drink it because there is no other place. And the Arabian desert is one of the most inhospitable places from a, you know, <laughs> geologically in the entire world. So that is why Muhammad said, yes, you can go ahead and use that water. And now let's talk about smacks of stupidity and delirium. Listen, when people came to Muhammad asking about what water to drink, they're not asking that from a scientific point of view because these are the people, of, these are the masters of desert survival. They're not coming to Muhammad to ask about drinking water because they already know the answers. They already know how to survive in the desert, but they're asking to see, will God punish us? us? Will God, is it sinful? to use this kind of water. So you can't be this 
ignorant as to assume. And of course, you know, you'll see on TV, there's many, uh, you know, Bear Grylls and other people who are drinking from the same dirty water because in a desert survival, that's the only thing you have. So that should debunk this alleged claim. Why did Muhammad allow that? Because it's not sinful. Now, the last thing I'm going to address is the issue. I think my time is up on pure. Muhammad said this is pure water, and I will debunk that as well. Go ahead. All right. Well, Nadir says that uh, that Jesus uh, gave scientifically inferior answers, and this calls into question the divinity of Jesus and so on. Again, uh, for purposes of this debate, let's suppose uh, everything Jesus ever said was completely wrong. Who did Muhammad affirm? <laughs> who did who does the Quran call the word of Allah? Jesus. So the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the gospel that Christians have, and Nadir is saying this book is riddled with scientific errors and blunders. What does this mean? It means that the Quran is affirming these scientific blunders. The Quran tells us to judge by the gospel, but Nadir is saying that this is the scourge of humanity, and it's this evil, horrible book, and it will get everyone killed. Really? Okay, so that's the book Allah tells us to live by and to judge by. Very strange. Um, he said that uh, that in the desert people had to drink uh, water with you know animals floating in it and so on. Really, do, do they need to perform ablutions with water with, that water that is filled with human waste, human excrement? Um, dead animals, used menstrual cloths? Do you have to perform ablutions with this? In other words, do you have to go and start rubbing this water, this disease-riddled water, on yourself? And Nadir says, well, they, uh, Muhammad's companions, they, are, they already knew what they had to do because they were desert people. Uh, in, multiple, in several of these hadiths, they're actually coming to him and asking him, hey, what about this water with a dead animal floating in it? Hey, what about this well over here that is used as a garbage dump and people throw their used menstrual cloths and, and they dump their, their human waste buckets into it? What's up with that water? Uh, should we be using that? And what does Muhammad say? Water is not made impure by anything. So they, they rub it all over themselves, and of course, you can drink it. And to say that the World Health Organization would agree with this is absolutely absurd. Please give your source. Okay, thank you. So you basically um, conceded to, now let's get back to this water is pure. Now, again, you know, you, you've got to be kind of very gullible uh, as to assume that when people came to Muhammad, they're asking about the water being drunken from a scientific perspective. No, they're not. They're not coming to, they already know how to drink this water. They already have the water filtration techniques and how to, and they do it better than Bear Grylls. They do it better than all the desert survival people that you are seeing on the screen tonight. Okay, so you gotta have some common sense. Nobody is coming to Muhammad asking, is this a safe source to drink from water? These are the people, the masters of air, uh, of desert survival. So let's talk about the catastrophe, which David Wood is basically suggesting to us, that Muhammad, Muhammad should have condemned that. Could you imagine that? That water for it was dead animals and feces and all that in there, that's the drinking water for people today. Could you imagine if Muhammad would have condemned that? You will see scores of dead people uh, all over the world. So th thank God he didn't do it. So now let's address the issue of pure water. The whole issue, I think you keep, why did Muhammad say that, look, this water is pure? Let's go. So here we see the lady, this, this child is drinking from the same water over here. It's, it's sad. So here's a hadith which you are quoting. It says, water is pure and it is not made impure by anything. The word there is yajnisu, from, from the word najasa. Now read the Holy Quran. It's the same word used over here. The disbelievers are najas. You see? Is, are they talking scientifically there? Or are they talking from a spiritual point of view? Uh, answer that question when you come up. Because it's the same word you're going to find in the hadith. You see? So it goes back to my what I was telling you. Muhammad is showing you, look, I, you, there, this is not something which is sinful to be drinking from. All right, Muhammad is not teaching water science to desert survivors over here. Okay, so please uh, have some common sense when you read the hadith. So, okay, so here we have uh, the verse which you need to address is uh, chapter 9, verse 28, where disbelievers are also nudges. Go ahead. Uh, yes, nudges, nudges is just something filthy. So you're saying that the, the Quran says that the unbelievers are filthy and therefore that 
saying water is not made filthy by anything <laughs> isn't a problem. Of course it's a problem. And again, if you were saying, hey, in some survival situation, sometimes you have to make do with whatever you have, that's fine. Do you really need to wash with it? If this is just for washings, we're not talking about drinking here, um, although you have the problem with that. Uh, but if this is just a matter of washing with it, do you really need to be rubbing this on your body? It looks like we're at an impasse here. You're saying, hey, you know, that sort of thing is fine. And I'm saying it's not. Uh, but you did say that we should go through issues one at a time. So let's go through a couple of them. So uh, just one issue, one issue. Uh, just because it's a common one, I'm sure you get this all the time, uh, but stars being missiles. So Surah 67, verse 5, and we have from of old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil ones and have prepared for them the penalty of the blazing fire. So stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons. And you have multiple passages on this in the Quran and in the Hadiths. But the general teaching is that when a demon tries to sneak into heaven to hear Allah's plans, Allah takes a shooting star and hurls it at the demon to, so that the demon won't hear his plans. And when you see a shooting star across the sky, it's because Allah has hurled a star at a demon, and that's what a shooting star is. Now, multiple problems here. Again, one, you know, that, that, a, uh, that a star is something that Allah hurls at uh, demons and hits them to keep them from sneaking into heaven, but also the issue of claiming that shooting stars are actually stars, which they aren't. So one issue at a time. What do you think of that? Well, thank you for not pepper spraying me with hundreds of points over here. Thank you for taking one issue at a time. I'm an old man. And what I think about shooting stars is once again, you are showing the scientific accuracy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But I find it very disturbing here that you, if you really believe Jesus is the Lord and Savior, you should have defended him and say, no, you know, you should have said not washing your hands before you eat. This is this is the sunnah, this is the way of Jesus, and you should have rebuked Muslims and Muhammad for teaching people to wash their hands before they eat and, uh, and you know, what, and clipping their nails. You should have defended Christ on that, but you didn't because you see he's wrong. <laughs> you know, so the issue of what makes Muhammad a, a true prophet here is that he, com he consistently corrects the wrong errors which you now see in the bible so now let's get to the shooting stars and we'll talk about the scientific miracle and scientific accuracy first of all the verse in the quran you will uh it, it does not say stars okay it says lamps okay so from a scientific perspective they're perfectly fine with that why because this is talking about some kind of miracle of almighty god taking place that god is going to take these lamps and hurl it at the at the devils from a sign now you might say oh i don't like that but you are supposed to be arguing from a scientific perspective. You are supposed to show us from scientific references that this is unscientific, which you will never be able to do. Why? Because just like apostate prophet, you are losing this URL challenge. If you go back to this debate over here, you will see him fall on his face because he can never bring a scientific reference which contradicts the Holy Quran. So now let me very quickly go to the scientific miracle because they asked Prophet Muhammad about the shooting stars because in the sky, that little streak in the sky, as David Wood said, this is these are not stars, okay? These are meteors which are being burning up in the atmosphere. Now look how when they ask, where's my notes? <laughs> look when they ask Prophet Muhammad this question, what he responds. And unfortunately my time is up. So in my next response, I'll show you that miracle. Do I just start, James? Okay. Um, so Nadir says that Surah 67.5 there isn't talking about stars because it says, and we have from of old adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil ones. All right. So he says, since it says lamps, it's not talking about stars, but we have the parallel passage in Surah 37 verses 6 to 10, where it talks about them in the same, in the same way that these are things that adorn the sky and so on. 
Uh, here's the passage for 37 verses 6 to 10. We have indeed decked the lower heaven with beauty and the stars for beauty and for guard against all obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits. So they should not strain their ears in the direction of the exalted assembly, but be cast away from every side, repulsed, for they are under a perpetual penalty, except such as snatch away something by stealth, so trying to steal information from Allah, and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness. That's the shooting star that uh, that we we've, we've heard so much about. So, so Nadir says in Surah 67:5 it says lamps, so it doesn't mean stars, but in Surah 37 it clearly says it clearly says stars. Uh, we also have Abu Qatada, one of Muhammad's companions, uh, explaining this in Surah 67 verse 5 of Sahih. I mean, uh, explaining Surah 67 verse 5 in Sahih al-Bukhari 3198. Abu Qatada mentioning Allah's saying, and indeed we have adorned the nearest heaven with lamps, Surah 67.5 said, the creation of these stars is for three purposes, and they are, one, as decoration of the nearest heaven, two, as missiles to hit the devils, and three, as signs to guide travelers. So if anybody tries to find a different interpretation, he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with what is beyond his limited knowledge. So notice, Abu Qatada just condemned any Muslim who comes up with another interpretation, which is what Nadir just did. So he stands condemned by Muhammad's own companions. Okay, let me quickly, I, I forgot to address a couple of points you raised. Uh, you said, okay, well, in ablution and doing wudu, why would Muhammad say people, okay, fine, you can go ahead and use that. Well, I will answer that with a counter question. And that question is, why are you assuming that the people he's talking to don't know basic water purification techniques? Why would Muhammad have to explain that to the people who are the masters of desert survival? That makes no sense at all. Okay, so again, but there's a there's a problem here. David Wood is having a problem finding scientific errors in the Quran. He's zigzagging all across, even Katada. He's going to the Hadith, and we could go there, no problem. But he's running away from the Quran. He can't find a scientific error in there. Telling us that there's lamps or even stars being hung, flung at the demons, no way does that in any way contradict science because these are talking about supernatural events. So these are miracles. He's losing the challenge, the URL challenge. He's falling on his face just like apostate prophet did because the Quran is not complete harmony with modern science. Now, again, on the shooting stars, I have not shown the miracle yet, but I will get to that. Uh, so I got one minute left here, and I want to just address some of the points, and then we'll get to the scientific miracle. You see David running, zigzagging to Ibn Qatada and all the people who have commented and things like that. You just need to open up the Quran and show us a scientific contradiction there. You are failing tonight. Everybody can see that. That's why you're zigzagging be between all these books, okay? So again, uh, and you have to show us a reference. I've shown you many references from, from modern science which agrees with, with the Holy Quran. You're not able to do so. Now, I do want to go back to also the issue of the, about this child suffering from epilepsy because we have not done that yet. You know, I've shown you from scientific references where science, not me, science points a finger at the teachings of the Bible for the stigmatization of epileptics as being demon-possessed. Muhammad comes back, also answers that, and he what he doesn't say, he doesn't accuse them of being demon-possessed or perform any kind of bogus exorcism. So here we see, and the fact that Muhammad's name is not in the scientific literature, that's the that's another issue which you'll, you will have to concede tonight, that Muhammad gave a scientifically superior answer on the issue of people who suffer seizures. So then I'll, I'll show you the miracle about the shooting stars. I promise after this. <laughs> okay, good. All right, since we're, we're, we're talking about shooting stars here, Sahih Muslim 5538. As we were sitting during the night with Allah's messenger, a meteor shot gave a dazzling light. So they saw a shooting star. Allah's messenger said, what did you say in the pre-Islamic days when there was such a shot of a meteor? They said, Allah and his messenger know best. But we, however, used to say that that very night a great man had been born and a great man had died. So their explanation before Muhammad was there to explain it to them was they took this as some sort of sign that a great man had been born, a great man had died. But Muhammad is there to give the true knowledge. 
whereupon Allah's messenger said, These meteors are shot neither at the death of anyone nor on the birth of anyone. Instead, Allah, the exalted and glorious, issues a command when he decides to do such a thing. Then the angels supporting the throne sing his glory, then sing the dwellers of heaven who are near to them until the glory of God reaches them who are in the heaven of this world. Then those who are near the supporters of the throne ask these supporters of the throne, what has your Lord said? And they accordingly inform them what he says. Then the dwellers of heaven seek information from them until this information reaches the heaven of this world. In this process of transmission, the jinn snatches what he manages to overhear and he carries it to his friends. And when the angels see the jinn, they attack him with meteors. All right, why is this relevant? The meteors are what Allah has hurled at a demon. What the Quran says is that that's what stars are. Stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons. So meteors are actual stars that Allah has thrown at a demon because he just he, he caught the demon, right? The demon's up, ah, that demon's listening to me. Star, bam, throws it, hits the demon. And Nadir is saying that this is somehow a scientific miracle. I'm looking forward to hearing this one, Nadir. Thank you so much. Um, so you got to still address the issue. Did Muhammad give a scientifically superior answer regarding the epileptics? Now, the moment we've all waited for, the scientific miracle. You see the hadith which David quoted, there's a trick question in there. They're asking, they, they, they basically were coming to Muhammad and they said, so, you know, you look, those are the shooting stars up in the sky. That's a trick question. Those are not stars. As David pointed out, those are meteors. If Muhammad was a false prophet, he would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know them shooting stars? <laughs> Let me tell you about them. Yeah, okay. So here's how those shooting stars work. Look at the astonishing scientific miracle. What does Muhammad say? He says, what do you people say about those, about what you see in the sky? He asked him, when you, this is, I'm sorry, let me, let me quote exactly. Uh, the messenger of Allah said, when you saw the likes of this during the days of, during Jahiliyyah, these vagrants, what do you say about that? Notice the scientific miracle. Number one, Muhammad refuses to address the, sci in, the scientifically incorrect uh, understanding of that time, which was that these were stars. He said, yeah, what do you say about that stuff? He refrains from addressing it, but let's continue. And then finally, the Prophet said, do you know what those are? And he quotes a, a verse of the Quran in which he <laughs> in which he quotes a Quran, which says that these are some things which are burning. She had this is the, the actual uh, what's it called? The actual verse says that these are something which are burning. When you go back to it, isn't that exactly what meteor? I'm sorry, what the shooting star phenomenon is? They're meteors burning in the atmosphere. Muhammad number one refers to them as burning and he refrains to repeat the scientifically incorrect statement that they are stars. That's a scientific miracle of the Holy Quran, I mean of the Hadith. But once again, we see a, we see a retreat. David Wood is not able to find scientific errors in the Quran regarding the huge long laundry list. Forget about it. He should bring up one issue at a time with me and show me where the Quran contradicts science. Show me URL references because you are falling just like a <laughs> just like a positive prophet. You will never find that with the Holy Quran because the Quran is in complete harmony with modern science. And, and I will challenge you again. Show me a link or a reference and juxtapose it with the Quran because I did it with the alcohol. Remember when they said alcohol was the more it, it, alcohol was more worse than better for you. It was word for word agreement with modern science. How is it that you cannot show a single reference that can contradict the Holy Quran? And so, and so that's again. I will repeat this challenge to you. Um, so Nadir says that there's actually a, a scientific miracle here because uh, Muhammad said something about burning, but you don't. You could actually go to the Quran and say that the Quran says that the jinn who tries to sneak into heaven and uh, listen on something, the Quran says that he is pursued by a flame of piercing brightness. So he's pursued by a flame. So that this is this is a miracle. 
Um, I don't know what the confusion here is. Nadir says, ah, but Muhammad, Muhammad says, uh, Muhammad doesn't answer and doesn't claim that these are uh, stars, I think Nadir said, but Muhammad specifically referred to Surah 67, verse 5, talking about the lamps. We know from the Quran that the parallel passage in Surah 37 is referring to stars. The lamps are the stars. This is confirmed by Abu Qatada that the that stars are there to be hurled at demons they're missiles to be hurled at demons so the fundamental error remains a shooting star that you see shooting across the sky is not an actual star that someone has thrown at a demon so there's a the one problem of one, what in the world does a shooting star shooting over your head have to do with uh, with any sort of demon? Is, is, a, is a meteor actually hitting a demon? So Nadir must be saying, yes, a meteor is something that has been hurled at a demon and is hitting the demon. That demon tried to sneak into heaven, which must just be right above our atmosphere because that's where that's where the, the meteor is being thrown. But the fundamental error here is that stars, the Quran says it's talking about stars that adorn the night sky when these stars are eventually used by Allah or his angels to pelt demons, the star is the shooting star. Shooting stars are not stars. That's the error. Shoot, a shooting star, you, it may look, you know, you see a bright thing in the sky, you think, oh, that's a, that's a star, and that's why they're called shooting stars, but they're not actually stars. And so the Quran is wrong. Well, the only problem here is we're not talking about the Quran. So, you know, the thing is, David, nowhere in the Quran does it say that the phenomenon you see in the sky, the, of the thing shooting, you know, the sky is, is, uh, is, is, this is some kind of shooting star. Muhammad made it clear for you, okay? So, you know, if you are going to make a claim that the Quran is claiming that the phenomenon you see in the sky, this is a najm, this is a shooting star, then you should... Share your desktop with all due respect. Show us the verse and juxtapose it with a, with a statement from science, and you will never do that. You're running around all over the place. Abu Qatada said this, and this guy said that, and this guy said that, but you are not able to show us from the Quran this. Okay, you are trying to create a type of confusion, a type of, because you know that there, that this, there are no contradictions in the Quran. So, you know, like I said, I, I'm not a Superman here where I can just follow him through the zigzag pattern. But let me assure you, nowhere in the Holy Quran, and I will challenge you here tonight, does it say that the phenomenon you see in the sky of that shooting streak, this is a shooting star, this is a najam. Nowhere is that in the Quran. If you are quoting Abu Qatada, once again, this only backfires on you because that raises a, a, a devastating question for David Wood. Why can we not find these scientific errors in the Quran? Why do you have to go to commentaries to find the scientific errors? But then he shifts the goalpost. But these are the most holy men. These are people who learn from Muhammad himself. This is a separate issue. Okay, so, so I think that I want, to, I want to take you back to the issue of the epileptics. I have presented to you references from science pinpointing and putting the blame on that passage in the Bible for the stigmatization of, of epileptics. Uh, the teachings of the, of the Gospels is solely responsible for that. I also showed you from epilepsy.com where even today people are still being stigmatized. And so when you look at the response which Muhammad gave, once again, it is a scientifically superior answer by not accusing that person of being demon-possessed. Thus, Muhammad lifts the stigma. This is what I'm talking about. Muhammad rescues people and lifts the curse upon them. A 2,000-year-old curse was placed upon them. Muhammad liberates the epileptics and sets them free. So you should also address this because you said, okay, if it's just alcohol, my dear, anybody can do that. But now I'm showing you an astonishing five or the four scientific corrections to the Holy Bible. Man. A man 1,400 years ago cannot do that. An illiterate man. We've only got a few more segments left before we go into the next part of the debate. Go ahead, David. Uh, yeah, Nadir continues saying that this is not actually in the Quran. Uh, let's recap, Surah 67, verse 5. And we have from of old or adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we have made such lamps as missiles to drive away the evil ones, and have prepared for them the penalty of blazing fire. So what are the lamps that are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons? 
Surah 37, verses 6 through 10. We have indeed decked the lower heaven with beauty in the stars, for beauty and for guard against all obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits. What does the Quran say? The stars, the stars that you see in the sky, they are for guarding against obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits. And it goes on to say that if a, a, the, the spirits strain their ears in the direction of the exalted assembly, so they're listening into his plans, um, they will be cast away from every side, repulsed, for they are under perpetual penalty, except, as su uh, except such as snatch away something by stealth, and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness. So when a demon successfully hears something about Allah's secret plans, and then he runs, Allah hurls a star at him, clearly says stars in this passage, Allah hurls a star at him, that's the piercing brightness that you see. We know from Sahih Muslim that Muhammad brings up the, what the Quran says about stars being missiles in the context of him and his followers seeing a shooting star. They see a shooting star and they, Muhammad explains, ha, what you used to believe about shooting stars is wrong. I'm going to tell you the truth. What's actually happened is revealed in the Quran. When you see a shooting star, it's because Allah or his angels hurled a star at a demon. Nadir somehow looks at all of this and says, um, nope, there's no contradiction here with science. There's no error here. There's no problem here. And uh, if, if, if this isn't a problem, then I don't know what could possibly be a problem for, for your Quran here, Nadir. We've got one short two-minute segment left from each of you, and then we're going into the five-minute closings. Nadir, go ahead. With all, with all due respect to you, David, honestly, you zigzagging. And there's a verse here and a verse there and a verse there. Share your desktop. Show us the verse, just like I did. Okay, I, <laughs> let us show for the record this nonsense, which David Wood is trying to tell us that the phenomenon we see in the sky of the, you know, like it looks like a shooting star. This is not mentioned that this is, or this is um, nowhere in the Quran does that phenomenon affirm that they are stars. Nowhere. But we go back to the scientific miracle of Prophet Muhammad. Remember, they asked him, there was a trick question. So, you know, them shooting stars. Uh, and look how Muhammad responds back. He says, well, what do you say about those things? He refuses to respond, to repeat the scientifically incorrect statement. Again, I'm not a Superman. Him, him quoting verse, 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 Ibn Qatada, oh, I can't keep up with that. <laughs> so please share your desktop, show us the verse. Let's look at what you're talking about, just like how I'm doing, okay? So I'm not gonna even chase after that. I did not address all the claims tonight, like the, the one which is left is about the so-called flat earth or whatever that nonsense stuff is. Don't worry, um, I will address that later. So tonight I can only address the time which I can, you know, alleged scientific contradictions which I have the ability to do so. And I think I have pointed out tonight that the Quran is in complete harmony with modern science. And I have all, uh, and, and I guess I can now make the claim that Wood, just like Apostate Prophet, is not able to take a verse from science and, a, and something from the Quran and show a contradiction between the two. He's just basically creating some kind of smoke screen. Oh, yeah, you know, that verse means this and that verse means that. Uh -uh. That, 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 that does not substitute uh, for this challenge over here, okay? So um, I think what's important here tonight is the Quran does alleviate the misery and suffering caused by the teachings of the New Testament. And, you know, once again, he's, he's running away from the issue of the epileptics. How do you explain? Now, you did concede that, okay, Muhammad gave a better answer on washing hands and other issues. What about the epileptics? Go ahead, David, last two minutes. Um, so, uh, on the issue of stars, Nadir keeps say, saying, uh, show him my desktop. Uh, I'm using my laptop for the Muslim sources, but I've given the references. I've read them to you repeatedly. Um, I don't know what else to do. Allah says it's stars. He says that the lamps are stars. He says this in the Quran. Um, he says that when a demon tries to sneak into paradise, Allah hurls the stars. And that's what you see, this, this flame of piercing brightness. And if that's not enough... Uh, Muhammad said this in the context of him and his followers seeing a shooting star, and then he appealed to the Quran to say that that is what is going on. And if that's not enough, I quoted Abu Qatada just to show that Muhammad's own companions confirmed my interpretation, not Nadir's. Nadir looks at all of this and says, nope, no problem here. This is just amazing stuff. On the issue of uh, 
of possessions, uh, it doesn't it doesn't take long to start looking around very quickly and, and see what's going on uh, with Islam and possession. So uh, we could go into more detail on this if you want. Um, but source right here, just pulled it up. In one Muslim country, Afghanistan, a common exorcism practice as of 2013 that has been criticized as inhumane was to secure the mentally ill to religious shrines for 40 days to ritually exor exercise the jinn possessing them. Patients are fed a strict diet of bread and black pepper, do not have a change of clothing, and sleep on the ground. Those who do not survive the treatments are buried in earthen mounds around the shrine. Now, we can continue. There is uh, there, there are people who, who actually die from Islamic ritualistic um, exorcisms. So if Nadir is defending this as his evidence that Islam has rescued people from this, uh, Islam's doing a pretty bad job of it. You got it. We'll jump in to closing statements. These are five minutes each, and then we're going to go into the Q&A. So if you happen to have questions, folks, we've got a good long list already. So we're going to read through them as fast as we can. With that, thanks so much. Nadir, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think this is a you know this is an open and shut case. Uh, tonight was a clean sweep. Every single scientific correction David Wood has conceded tonight that Muhammad gave the better answer. And uh, you know, and I think you know really the what, what, uh, yeah. This is what I'm when you're talking about shooting stars and things like this. This is my expectation for you. Show the verse. Show us where it actually says stars and things like that. I'm not going to chase after you. Say, oh, well, you know, it's like this and it's like that. Uh -uh, I'm not going to do that. But anyway, this is my closing statement. Just ignore him on that because he would not show us where it really uh, contradicts science. But anyways, like I said, we found astonishing word for word agreement with the Holy Quran. And he tried to quote tonight. Oh, you see, the alcohol is actually good for your heart. You see, so it's actually a good thing that, you know, um, that, that, the, that the Bible does allow alcohol. That has been de debunked by modern science, as we can see here. Many studies have shown the overall health risk of drinking alcohol outweighs any benefit. Word for word agreement in the Holy Quran, Allah for chapter two, verse 29. So these are two scientifically correct statements on alcohol. It says, and they have some benefits for the people, but their harm is far greater than their benefit. Astonishing word for word agreement. We also saw word for word agreement where science says today, not only should you wash your hands, but clip your nails. Prophet Muhammad said the exact same thing. And again, you know, Allah, he has, a, he has conceded tonight. Muhammad gave the scientifically superior answer than Lord and Savior himself. So he's all about, so what? Who cares? You know, that doesn't make you a prophet. Uh, yes, it does. Because how can a man 1400 years ago, an illiterate man in the desert, know the scientific errors of the Bible and correct them one by one? The virginity, biblical virginity test, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go over. This was basically the Bible uh, asked for uh, authorizes a virginity test to be performed on women. But today, science tells us this is uh, scientifically incorrect. We, these things are inaccurate and it stigmatizes girls who have been sexually assault, molested, that they are going to go through this virginity test. Prophet Muhammad abolishes the virginity, virginity test, but at this point, who cares because we have already enough compiled enough evidence. So this is a misery. This is suffering. This is the misery and suffering which lays in wait for you when you give your life to Jesus Christ. I have presented to you documented scientific evidences to support all of that. How does this make Muhammad a true prophet? The astonishing miracle we saw tonight was that Prophet Muhammad corrected all of these scientific blunders in the Bible. And by doing so, he removes the curse upon mankind. Okay, and let there be no mistake, this is a curse, what you're seeing over here. You know, and, and let me let me go ahead and share also one. This is about uh, this is going back to the epileptics, which which Wood would refuses to address. He talked about Afghanistan. Thank you for bringing this up. That's right. That is sign. This is so. Here we see this curse is spreading like a virus all throughout, not just in the Christian community, but even in the Muslim community, which raises a very disturbing question: Why can we not find these scientific inaccuracies in the Quran? or it was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what he's showing you is that in spite of the pressure of, of trying to claim that epileptics were demon-possessed, Muhammad refrains from saying that. 
And so let me go ahead and quote for you. This is, and I think this is really powerful, this child sharing his testimony in Epilepsy Foundation. So notice the authoritative references I'm presenting. You know, has anybody had a problem with a religious family member whipping out Mark and claiming that, you know, he's demon possessed, you're not right with God? This is what the, this is a direct result, impact of the teachings of the Bible. I've also pointed out, I'm quoting Dr. Carl Otten Nakin, who's a specialist in neurology at the Oslo University. He pinpoints the teachings of the Bible for the stigmatization of epileptics, okay? And not just him. I have several peer-reviewed journals. Let me go quickly through this. All of them are pointing the finger at Christ and the teachings of the Bible for the stigmatization of epileptics which Wood has ran away from tonight, okay? So that's what makes Prophet Muhammad a true prophet because Prophet Muhammad, as we see, gave a scientifically superior answer and he liberates them from the horrible stigma, millions of epileptics from the horrible stigma of, 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 of being called demon possessed. And that is what the Bible says, the truth will set you free. And that's exactly what Muhammad did with the epileptics. So I'll, in closing, I'll give you one analogy. Oh, right? we, well, I was like, well, technically it's five minutes. Oh, okay, I'm done. Thank you. We're gonna jump I, uh, regarding the scientific errors, I didn't have a chance to really address all of them. So don't, that's not a blame on Islam. That's on me, okay? <laughs> we'll jump over to David for his five-minute closing as well. All right. Well, N Nadir says that uh, I pepper sprayed him and he didn't have time to respond to everything. Uh, but as far as I could tell, he didn't respond successfully to anything that I brought up. So notice, I mean, if yes, I gave a bunch of examples of scientific errors in the Quran and the Hadith. Um, but he could have picked any one of them to show that it's not a problem. The only ones that he did choose to respond to didn't go anywhere. So what are we left with? Muhammad believed that there are seven earths, they're all flat, that they're stacked on top of each other like pancakes on the back of some giant fish or whale, that's the nun of Surah 68, um, that out on the side of the top pool there, I mean, on the top earth, there's this pool where the sun goes down. Uh, if you didn't think the Quran was clear enough, even though the Quran repeatedly claims to be clear, well, Muhammad said in the Hadith to one of his companions, yes, the sun goes into a pool. Uh, above that, you have the lowest heaven where there are stars that adorn the sky. Nadir keeps challenging me on this. Again, Surah 37, 6 through 10, we have indeed decked the lower heaven with beauty in the stars. What's he talking about? Stars. For beauty and for guard against all obstinate, rebellious, evil spirits. This is quoting the Quran, and Adir seems to think that I'm inventing this out of midair. He says he's talking about stars and that these are for guarding against evil spirits. And he goes on to say that when one listens in, he hurls it. And you get the, the, the piercing brightness that you see. Muhammad in Sahih Muslim says, starts pointing to what the Quran says in Surah 67 verse 5 about stars being missiles, uses this to respond when he's explaining what a shooting star is and trying to explain to his followers, hey, you didn't understand what shooting stars are until now because I'm breaking it down for you. And if this wasn't enough, we have Abu Qatada explaining everything. Nadir says, uh, he acts like I'm just making this up and he just doesn't see it. Well, if you don't see that and it's as clear as day, great. That's not the problem with the Quran. That's the problem with you not listening to what Allah and Muhammad have said. Um, so that's what we have in the lowest heaven. But then we have the, the rest of the heavens. And these are these domes that will fall on us if Allah doesn't uh, hold them up. What did Muhammad get right here? Uh, how has Nadir defended any of this? Um, he just keeps saying, well, no, you you haven't shown any error and it's this is all a miracle somehow. And on the issue of human reproduction, uh, we still haven't gotten a response. Semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs, according to Muhammad. This uh, mixes with the female semen and then one of the semens will dominate the other and that's what will determine eventually the the sex of the child and the child's appearance and so on um muhammad gets all of this wrong a, a 40 day stage of being a mixture of semen that's wrong a blood clot stage this is wrong he's wrong on everything he's saying here and the deer doesn't see any errors no matter no matter what the quran says uh on the issue of uh, hygiene and the spread of disease, Nadir is the one who appealed to 
Muhammad's teaching about ablutions as something that is scientifically accurate. Well, you look at a little a look a little closer, and what do you have? Hey, there's a there's a a pool of water there, and it's filled with dead animals with used menstrual cloths, and that's where people dump their uh, their excrement buckets into. Do we really need to wash up with that water? Well, they don't have any other water. Oh, great. Then don't rub it on yourselves, period. Right? That would be the correct scientific response. Unfortunately, Muhammad gave the incorrect scientific response. Uh, so Muhammad got everything that he could possibly get wrong. And at the end of the day, Nadir is saying things like, uh, Muhammad said, clip your nails. Muhammad said, clip your nails. It makes him a prophet. So anyone who says, clip your nails is a true prophet. Um, Islam, Islam teaches that there's jinn possession. Islam teaches uh, methods of dealing with the jinns. Um, so the, the only thing Nadir has at the end of the day, he's claiming that Jesus made mistakes that Muhammad came to fix. Well, think about this. Again, I said, for argument's sake, suppose that everything Jesus ever said is scientifically inaccurate. The Quran affirms Jesus as a true prophet who gets his revelations from Allah, and the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the gospel that Christians still have. Nadir has spent the bulk of his uh, argument arguing that the revelation that his prophet affirmed as true revelation from Allah is actually uh, causing mass destruction in the world. Okay, well, what, what Muhammad should have said is, hey, whatever you do, don't believe in that book and don't believe in Jesus because it's a disaster and I'm here to save you from them. Not what he said. Nadir has spent this entire time attacking his own prophet and his own God Hi. for affirming a book that Nadir attacks as scientifically inaccurate.